Please take your conversations live. Listen up! Let's keep it Turn it up a little more. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome. Oh, well, get this started officially. The College of Complexes is now in session. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to the College of Complexes. And there are two rules at the college that all of you know about. And the first one is no personal attacks. The second one is one oh, fool at a time. The College of Complexes consists of the I'm following sorry. format. The first part is a brief announcements period. And we would like announcements and have it brief. The second part is our speaker speaks. And after the speaker speaks, there will be a brief question and answer period. And then we follow by our infamous rebuttal period. We will try to get as much rebuttals as possible. And I think tonight we're going to have two speakers. The first one is uh, Peter Cole from PhD from Western Illinois University. The influential workers of the world is a union unlike any other. Founded in 1905 in Chicago, it rapidly gained members across the world thanks to its revolutionary internationalist outlook. By using powerful organizing methods, including direct action in the back democracy, the IWW put power in the hands of workers. From an international perspective, the book includes accounts from a, a number of diverse countries, including Australia, Canada, Mexico, South Africa, Sweden, and Ireland, I lost my place. which reveal a fascinating story of global anarchism, syndicalism, what is it? Syndicalism and socialism. Drawing on many important figures, the movement such as Tom Barker, Har Doyle, Joe Hill, James Larkin, and William Dean, Big Hill Haywood, the, and exploring particular industries including shipping, mining, and agriculture. This book describes how the IWW and its ideals traveled around the world. We'll be having that author speak tonight, Mr. Peter Cole. Can you stand, Mr. Peter, and let everyone know who you are? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Charlie, you said you had a second? Yeah, we've got representatives of the Chicago uh, branch of the IWW right here. And how many are there? I don't know, as many as we feel like. Um, and uh, we have a spokesperson, I think I saw, I think I saw Brother Joe there. He's coming on May 5th. Okay, so we'll have two groups of speakers. The first is the author of this book, and the second is the local chapter for the IWW. Let's introduce our speaker. Peter Cole, let's give him a rousing round of applause. Please remind you, we are kind of crowded tonight, so please be a little patient with our waitress. And uh, just give her a little time. Peter, come on up. And be sure to tip her big. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know most of you come out here anyway, whoever's speaking, but I appreciate it anyway. So um, I recently had a book that I helped edit that was published. It's called Wobblies of the World, A Global History of the IWW. Are they for sale? They are for sale. Uh, How much? 20 bucks, cash. <laughs> okay. And I have copies in the back. Um, so, who am I? What am I doing here? Um, I'm a historian, I'm a professor also, and I've written uh, several books on the history of the industrial workers of the world, the union I'm going to talk about tonight. I know that there's some members here tonight too, which is awesome. Of course, the IWW was founded in Chicago, and so it has a great history here in our city. You ask, the, ask the people who are IWW members to raise their hand. Who are the IWW members in the house? There you have it. Yeah. So now you know who to trust. So um, 20 years ago, or actually or so, I uh, published a, wrote a dissertation on a group of wobblies in Philadelphia where they were dock workers and they loaded and unloaded ships. They're also called longshoremen. And later that became a book and it's called Wobblies on the Waterfront. And it's about how in Philadelphia, which used to be one of the greatest ports in the United States and one of the great industrial cities, um, the workforce was 
um, very diverse, approximately one third African American, and probably one third Irish and Irish American, and about one third East Europeans. And as we all know, diversity in America is often used by employers to weaken workers and make unions harder to organize. The Wobblies, however, were anti-racist from their birth and um, were consistently committed to a multi-ethnic, multi-racial institution and world. Um, and although that rhetoric is awesome, um, when it came down to it, uh, rarely did many African Americans join the IWW. Um, however, in Philadelphia, there were several thousand members of the union that I wrote about, and so that the union I wrote about was uh, um, the only black majority local in the entire IWW. Quick question, can you explain what an a wobbly is? A wobbly is a nickname for someone who's a member of the industrial workers of the world. Thanks. Okay. Um, so IWW is the initials and wobbly is someone who's a member of the IWW. It's a friendly term uh, used by members as well as by non-members to describe someone. And I'm going to use that term a lot, so thanks for pointing that out. So I wrote this book called Wobblies on the Waterfront. I also edited a book called Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. Ben Fletcher was the leader of Local 8, the union on the Philadelphia waterfront. And Fletcher was an African American from Philadelphia who was the most well-known African American in the IWW ever, I guess, um, and um, was the leader of the local that I wrote about. And so I also edited a book where I collected everything that he had written or had been written about him um, and with a sort of a long introduction. And that was actually published also in 2007 by Chicago's Charles Kerr Press, um, which of course is sort of still around today, but was born in Chicago and was uh, uh, the first great independent radical publisher in the United States, really. Uh, I think they were the first publisher to, um, for instance, publish Mother Jones's autobiography among many other uh, landmarks in Charles Burroughs history already. So that's my background and why I was first interested in the IWW. However, although I was very proud of my work, um, like most people who have are historians like myself, and the way that historians in the United States are trained, but also the way historians in most other countries in the world are trained, is that we usually focus on a specific nation. And so we look at an institution or an individual or a series of events, but it's almost always um, in the context of and exclusively about one country. Um, in the case of uh, me, it was the United States, so I was trained as a historian of the United States. Um, so when I was doing research for my dissertation and later my book, I would often come across examples of international connections um, that was happening in Philadelphia. And of course, I also was studying shipping, which is an international industry, right? So maybe not surprising. And so in my book, um, there were many references to people who are not born in the United States or traveling to the US or working briefly in the US or that the folks I studied were interested in what was going on in other countries. Um, but despite that reality, um, I largely wrote my book in the context of American history, right? Within the context of American history. Um, and so, for instance, um, the uh, image on the right um, is uh, a Finnish language IWW newspaper that was published in Canada, right? Um, and it's announcing a tour given by Ben Fletcher, um, Ben Fletcher being the black leader of the union I study. Um, and it's announcing that Fletcher is giving a tour in Northern Ontario in 1927. Um, and it's being announced in the Finnish language Wadley paper in, in Canada, right? Um, now, not only did I know, not know that existed, um, because I did not read Finnish, um, I wouldn't have been able to understand it even if I did, right? Um, and of course, in the 90s, uh, we didn't have Google Translate either, right? And so, um, it's an example of that I missed all sorts of international connections that were often staring me in the face, right? Um, and what I missed, um, historians, not just myself, um, but historians around uh, who studied the IWW for the last 60 years, also missed these exact same sorts of connections, right? And so the problem is, is that we have this institution whose name is the Industrial Workers of the World, right? Um, whose, in fact, is widely known that the IWW had members in, locals in, newspapers in, um, many countries, right? Um, yet no one, and when I say no one, I mean no one ever wrote about them in a global context. No one ever tried to write an international history of this institution. Not only that, 
many of us, of course, are ignorant of multiple languages, right? And so, like, wouldn't have been able to, even if we had imagined trying to write in an in international history of this institution, even though, when they were born, they called themselves the industrial workers of the world, right? And so me and everyone before me, whoever wrote about the IWW, missed what was staring us in the face, right? Um, that we have an international organization that was ignored for its international implications, right? And instead was solely looked at as an institution inside the United States. And when people wrote about the IWW in other countries, they did the same thing, right? And so people who wrote about the Wobblies in Mexico, or Chile, or Australia, for instance, also were guilty of the same thing that I was guilty of, right? Yet, nevertheless, the IWW imagined itself from its birth as an international organization, right? Um, the IWW had members in dozens of countries, right? um, and the IWW, in fact, was very internationalist, despite the fact that everyone who chronicled them failed to acknowledge that. Right? Um, and for those of us who have studied the history of the IWW, um, a number of the classic histories actually were written in the 1960s, a time of great radicalism, but are guilty of the same crimes. Right? And so if you look at general histories of the IWW today, um, in English, in the United States, they will be entirely about the history of the IWW in the United States, even though they existed in many countries. Moreover, even in the United States, the IWW had many foreign language newspapers and magazines, because a great many of its members were in fact not born in the United States, um, and often wrote in their native languages. Right? Um, and so what we've got here is a bit, um, paradox is too strong a word, right? Um, but what you've got is that the IWW was international. It spread very quickly from Chicago and the United States to many other countries, and I'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes. Um, their members spoke many languages and wrote in many languages, um, yet historians had failed right, um, to adequately understand this organization, and so failed to present that to the rest, right? Because most of us would, um, don't study the actual documents of an institution, we actually get it secondhand, what, essentially through historians and journalists as opposed to um, from the institution themselves. Right? So, um, with that sort of prelude, yeah, what we've got here is, uh, let me tell you a history of the book. Right? Um, about 10 years ago, I was with uh, at a history conference in Vancouver in British Columbia in Canada with a couple other guys who were also interested in the industrial workers of the world, who were a bit younger than me, they were writing their dissertation still, and I was already a professor, right? Um, and we were having some drinks, and we said, geez, like, this is an international organization. They actually, not me, um, read multiple languages. One of my friends, Kenyon Zimmer, reads um, Italian and Yiddish, um, and uh, the other friend, David or Dave Struthers, reads Spanish very well, right? And so they were writing on different aspects of the IWW in Mexico and the United States. Um, and while we were drinking, we basically said, wouldn't it be great if there was a book, right? Um, that, in fact, was an international history of the IWW, right? And we agreed. Um, and then we probably forgot about it for years, right? Um, and didn't talk about it, didn't do anything about it, um, were busy doing other things. Um, but nevertheless, what we eventually came back to uh, about six or seven years later was going, geez, we really should do this book. No one has done this book. The IWW and the world are changing, and we need actually an international history. And let us, let me re-emphasize that many, perhaps most Wobblies didn't speak English, didn't write in English. Right? And that we knew that in the U.S. alone, literally the majority of IWW affiliated papers were not in English. And so what happens is, is, the image on the left, right, is actually the Patterson, New Jersey headquarters of the IWW, but also um, doubled as a, um, a publication, right, uh, the offices of an Italian language newspaper, right? Image on the right um, is a Brooklyn-based um, Spanish language newspaper, right, is that many historians, including the quote-unquote leading historians of the IWW, ignored the entire non-English language literature because they were good Americans, which meant they didn't know shit about any language other than American English, right? And so their failings became our failings, and now we are in the process of correcting those failings, right? Um, and so what we got together and ultimately did is contacted people we knew who worked on this union. We also, through the internet, put out calls for other people interested in and researchers of, and ultimately got 
um, dozens of um, submissions uh, for this anthology that we ended up getting published. Uh, and the book, which I have here, has got about 20 chapters. There's about 20 of us who've written. The majority of the people who've written for this book, each individual chapter, um, most of them are looking at sources that are not English language sources. Right? Um, and so actually, only a few of the chapters in the book deal with the United States at all. Uh, most of them deal with countries other than the United States. Right? Um, and that was, again, the key is, is that to understand, if you, if you think you want to understand the IWW, to only uh, uh, read its English stuff is a fail, right? Um, it's essentially you are doing yourself an injustice, right? Um, we're doing a service because we're bringing it to you in English because uh, um, a lot of us, including myself, don't speak other languages or read other languages. But if you believe in IWW vision, which again is the industrial workers of the world, then uh, this book is the first of its sort, right? Um, Another aspect of this book that we wanted to highlight, which seems very 21st century, even though it is not new, is that many people, many ideas, many newspapers and magazines were in fact not focused solely on a single city or country, but in fact were crossing borders, were crossing borders. Now academics use fancy terms just like we did in the past, and so it's a common term now among university folks that could use the term transnational. You're crossing nations, right? You're crossing these national boundaries. Right, um, the IWW was crossing these boundaries, and they weren't the first, right, a hundred years ago, right? Um, and so we have to understand that almost every institution, including the one I studied in Philadelphia, was in fact transnational, right? Not just those who worked in maritime, although that is the most logical, but even those who weren't were physically crossing borders or sharing, writing letters to each other, right, or publishing um, and writing to publications in other countries. And that uh, Wild Ways of the World, which is the name of the book that I've helped organize, right, um, fully is essentially the major theme in the book is how multinational, but not multinational, but transnational, right, really this, this organization was. So for instance, the images here, um, there's a famous concept called sabotage, which is widely um, debated as to what it means. Right? It means different things to different people. It's not an English word, right? It's a French term. Um, but uh, it means different things to different people. In the concept of many people, what it means is destruction of property. Um, but in the concept of the IWW, what it often meant was essentially slowing things down or messing things up in order to basically make the boss's life harder, right? Not necessarily destruction of property, but that's possible, right? Um, but more generally, um, how to basically exert power on the job in various ways, right? Um, so, for instance, the concept of sabotage was brought to the United States um, to the Wobblies by Big Bill Haywood, um, who was one of the leaders and founders of the IWW. He was, spent a lot of time in France in 1909-1910, and he was the one, after he was in France, when he came back to the U.S., he essentially, he wasn't the first person to bring the concept to the U.S., but to the IWW, right, that, um, that what is sabotage, right, like, uh, and how could the Wobblies use it? Often in the United States context, in the IWW, um, the symbols of the wooden shoe, which is the uh, sabbat, meaning as a, a French for shoe, right? Um, but, uh, or I don't speak French, so right? like, uh, but uh, that uh, also the black hat, right? Like, that these are terms for what are just called direct action, right? Which means many different things, not necessarily um, destruction of property. Um, but the key point is, is that um, the United States isn't by itself, of itself, and it's not influenced by others. And so what we've got is that many European ideologies, including the idea of sabotage, are shaping the American context. Why does this matter? Well, again, if you read the IWW, the history of the IWW, since none of us were around in 1905 who are still alive, um, we would have been told by the old historians that the IWW was an American organization, as opposed to a multinational organization that in fact was incorporating foreign influences into it from its inception, because there's big debates about you know, uh, real Americans, of course, don't need to sort of have to listen to what's going on in other countries. We can develop our own homegrown radicalism right here. Um, let me highlight the subtitle of the book. It's A Global History of the IWW, not the Global History of the IWW, because our book is not a complete history. It would be impossible to write a complete history of anything, um, but definitely not of this institution. Um, it's suggestive of what was happening in the uh, IWW, especially in its first three or so decades, but it's not a complete history. There's plenty of um, opportunities for more people to do more research, for more work to be done, and a whole lot of different aspects of it. Um, but we do hope that 
um, our book will be, um, will shift the conversation, right? Um, so that no one in the future will be guilty of the same problems that we've done in the past, right? Um, again, because almost all the books you pick up on the IWW are very inward focused on a single country. Um, there's a book that came out just a couple years ago, some of you might know, it's called um, The Wobblies in Their Heyday by a guy named Eric Chester, for instance. Um, and uh, I wrote this review where I said, I can't believe this guy's writing a history of the IWW where he talks nothing about the IWW outside of the USA. Um, I was guilty of that, of course, in 1997, but you know, the time times moved on. Right? So um, another key point uh, I want to highlight about the IWW and its history is that it's very tied to the, the political philosophy of uh, anarchism, right? Um, anarchism. Right. Um, anarchism is what I often call as left, left libertarians, right? Anti, anti-government folks, but we're also anti-capitalist. Um, and anarchists were very important in Chicago, as many of us know, in the 1870s and 1880s. The Haymarket is the most famous incident in the history of American anarchy, really. Um, many of us have heard of Lucy Parsons, Texas-born, but lived for most of her life in Chicago, uh, lived and died in Chicago, right? Um, her late husband, right, was one of the Haymarket martyrs, buried out in um, Oport, uh, Oport, Oport Park um, at the Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, and uh, Parsons was a uh, founder of the IWW. She was there in 1905 um, in Chicago, actually, what's now called River North. Um, and um, she, among others, was very internationalist. Um, so that at the founding convention of the IWW, among other things she did, was she noted in 1905 Congratulations to the radicals in Russia who've just attempted a revolution. Right? Um, of course, it was a failed communist revolution in 1905, but the Wobblies from their inception were very much thinking about that. Um, why do I highlight the anarchism? It's because if you study the IWW closely, it's, it's why they're so suspicious of state actors. Right? Many other socialists believe that the proper solution to achieve socialism is through a political party right? or some through electoral process. The Bobbleys were anti-political because they believed that essentially if you had power to sort of make radical change through the state, then you wouldn't be given the right to vote, you know, like uh, that the elites are never going to willingly let the masses um, peacefully transition, right? Um, and so um, they also believed that the courts were totally rigged against uh, working class people, right? Um, and so they, net, they had no faith in the political system Here, to do the job. Instead, they believed that only through power on the job i.e. union power, could real change happen, right? Um, that the electoral system was not a, a path towards socialism. It's a reformist path, but ultimately not a successful path. So if you believe, like they did, yeah, um, uh, and unlike the Socialist Party of the United States at the time, right, which was running candidates for office, for instance. Yeah. Um, let me just highlight, I hate to take things for granted. Um, the IWW was born in 1905, right? Um, the Wobblies were part of an anarchist and also sometimes called syndicalist tradition. Syndicalist is essentially um, unionist anarchists, because not all anarchists are really into unions. Lots of anarchists are sort of middle class individualistic folks who don't really care about working class power. Right? Um, so anarchists and syndicalists were very influential in many places, in many countries around the world. Okay. This is before World War I. Please explain the terms anarchist and syndicalist. Okay, I think I just did, um, but uh, I'll explain them again. Right? Anarchists are people who don't believe in state actors. Right? Um, they, they are suspicious of state power because they believe essentially the state is a system that is, uh, takes away freedom as opposed to uh, facilitating freedom. Right? Um, syndicalists are um, union sorts of anarchists. Right? Um, they are cousins or sisters of the like. Um, other socialists do believe in a political path to power. So the Socialist Party, which existed at that time, this is before the Soviet Union exists, right? This is before the Soviet Union exists. And so there were people who believed in communism, but there was no Soviet Union yet. Although in World War I, that would change. And by the 20s, communism, with the Soviet Union at its lead, will be essentially replace the socialists and the anarchists and syndicalists as being the most influential left-wing philosophy in the world, including in the United States. Right, um, so now to sort of give you a taste of some of the different chapters in this book. Um, so Wobblies and Wobbly ideas spread around the world. Many Wobblies came from Spain and Italy, where there are previous traditions of anarchism, right? Um, and as many of these people were immigrating to the United States, 
but also as many worked on ships, especially sailors, right, in the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean, right, um, they brought their ideas with them, including Pedro Estepe, um, who was president in Chicago in 1905, but who was a um, Catalan, um, but who lived in New York City for a long time. Uh, many um, throughout Latin America, uh, the IWW is quite influential, especially in Mexico and Chile, but also in Argentina, Cuba, and other places. Right? Um, Tampico is a Caribbean port city of Mexico. It, it was and is still the most important port for the export of oil. Right? Um, and Tampico had a very large wobbly presence in the 19-teens and 1920s. Um, and so uh, one of our chapters deals a lot with Tampico. But if you read the chapter on Tampico, you'll quickly see that these Mexicans were basically organizing across the border with folks in the United States, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, as well as allies. And you might also know the 19 teens was during the Mexican Revolutionary time. And so actually, a lot of things are going on in Mexico that have ramifications um, as well. Um, the United, the Wobblies were very influential in Canada, right, as well, both in, um, say, the forests and mines of Ontario, um, but also in the forests and in the port of Vancouver in British Columbia. Um, and so uh, the Wobblies basically quickly spread after 1905 into neighboring countries. Um, and that people were constantly crossing. Um, you know, it's not even until really the 1920s that the U.S. government has a, a good handle on immigration, right? Um, and so it's much easier actually to cross borders. Most people didn't, there was no such thing as passports in the 19th century, right? Like, and so um, it's only uh, more recently, we think we're freer to travel now. In many ways, we were freer to travel 100 years ago, right? Like, uh, because there was a lot less state control over the process of migration. Um, one example is Edith Frenette, uh, pictured in the center of the newspaper on the left, um, where Frenette was a, a wildly from Washington State who was very active in Seattle, Oregon, um, Everett, which is just north of Seattle, and it's the site of a famous thing called the Everett Massacre, when basically a bunch of um, deputies and citizens, quote unquote, um, shot and killed a bunch of wobblies for being wobblies, right, on the Everett Massacre of 1916. Um, is that in the timber area? Um, uh, yes, actually, Everett was uh, a mill town, right? And so um, it would be where the bro timber was brought in in order to turn into shingles, right, or cut logs, right, um, and the like. Um, so uh, another example, actually, from the Pacific Northwest, a uh, very interesting chapter, deals with um, South Asians, that is, people from what is now India and Pakistan, who are immigrants to the United States. Um, there wasn't a huge South Asian population in the United States at this time. It was in the thousands or tens of thousands, not nearly as large as many other groups. Right? Um, but uh, there were thousands of South Asians. She ordered mushrooms. There's mushrooms underneath the burger. Um, so the uh, South Asians were an immigrant population, yeah, who were, um, many of whom were um, in the Pacific Northwest, including some who worked in the, the timber industry, like this man was asking me about, right? Um, and there were already an anti-British movement in um, South Asia, as well as in the South Asian diaspora. And uh, the Punjabi word was Ghadar, which means mutiny or revolt, right? And the Ghadar movement was a global movement, anti-British, anti-imperialist movement. Um, the Ghadarites had people around the world because there was a global movement of South Asian people through the British Empire and beyond, right? Um, and so a number of these eight, uh, South Asians um, met the IWW when they were working in the, the timber fields in Washington State. Um, and because they were very dark skinned, they were treated like crap by the boss. But the Wobblies organized them, brought them into the union, and taught them about IWW ideas. And so IWW ideas came to influence the Goddard movement. Um, the Goddard movement is not well known about in India today because it wasn't a nationalist movement, right? It was anti British, but its goal was not to set up a nation called India, right? Their goal was actually a socialist multinational revolution as opposed to a national revolution. And so Goddard was very influential in the 19-teens and 20s, but subsequently is written out of the story of modern India. Right? Um, but a number of the leaders of this movement were in fact influenced uh, or members of the IWW, like the two men here. Um, there were Wobblies in Australia and New Zealand. Um, Wobblies, a lot of Wobblies were sailors. What do you do on ships? You talk with each other, you read, right? You learn. Um, you also learn pretty quickly that um, the captain's not your friend, right? Uh, it's a very, there's, a, there's a very strict class divisions on most ships, right? Um, and so um, lots of sailors and dock workers are 
often very radical. Yeah, uh, and so the Wobblies came to Australia, um, and in Australia, the Wobblies were very anti World War One. Of course, Australia was sending thousands and tens of thousands of people to die on the fields of Europe. You might ask, why would an Australian go to die in Turkey or France? What's well, it's not their war, right? Like, uh, but uh, the Wobblies in Australia, more so than in the United States, were very anti-World War I um, and took a lot of heat for that from the government. But among the working class majority of Australians, in fact, the IWW was much like, even though their ideas uh, did not result in them becoming the dominant uh, labor union, um, the IWW organized nearby New Zealand. Um, Again, wobblies um, are uh, sort of, some people become wobblies on their travels and come back to New Zealand. Sometimes it's sailors who come to New Zealand and bring with them the ideas, right? Um, one of the core chapters in the book, I think, is a guy who wrote about um, how IWW members who were of Anglo background learned Maori, which still, to my knowledge, is um, not very well spoken among non-Maori peoples in New Zealand. Right, um, and actually in the IWW newspaper in New Zealand had a Maori column, right, um, where they were appealing to Maoris to um, join the IWW using Maori cultural traditions, right, um, and so we've got a contributor in the book who reads Maori, he's not Maori himself, but uh, who um, translated basically every article from this publication, very, very, very cool. Um, you know, from Australia, which deported radicals from the UK, Tom Barker, the man on the left, yeah, um, Tom Barker, who organized in New Zealand and Australia, was deported, um, ends up in Chile. Um, the big port is Valparaiso, um, the biggest port on the South American Pacific coast. Um, he meets Wobblies there. He then travels to Buenos Aires with others, where he organizes in Buenos Aires. He later doesn't join the Communist Party, but actually um, is part of a group of Wobblies who actually raised support for the Soviet <coughs> Union in the 1920s, um, because, well, the Soviet Union was the first socialist revolution in the world. And so, at first, a lot of Wobblies were sympathetic to the communist uh, movement, although later they were disaffected. Moving a little more quickly, um, the IWW was influential in Ireland. Right? A lot of us know that um, Ireland has been a colony of the UK for almost 500 years. Right? Um, and two of the leaders of the Irish Republican movement in the 20th century were Jim Larkin on the left and James Connolly on the right. Both of them were members of the IWW. Right? Um, and both of them were very influenced by the ideas of the IWW, especially Larkin, the man on the left, um, who was, uh, well, is a legend still in Ireland. Um, Connolly helped um, in uh, the Easter Rising, the Irish Uprising in 1916 during World War I, and was killed by the British um, for his role in that. Um, but both of them were wobblies. Too. Um, I study South Africa. I've spent a lot of time in South Africa. I love the fact that the IWW was um, in South Africa. Um, so again, people from the British Isles, like the Scottish man on the left, Archie Crawford, um, traveled, moved to South Africa in the early 1900s, um, and brought with them the IWW to South Africa. Um, the IWW was the first non-black organization to be anti-racist. Right, um, the first non-white organization to be take a principled stand. This is decades before apartheid existed, but it was already a highly racist society. Right? Um, and so um, the IWW helped organize dock workers in Cape Town on the Atlantic coast. Um, and the first major labor union of Africans in South Africa was called the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, led by a man who's now from what's called Malawi, but at that time was called Nyasaland. Um, and the ICU organized hundreds of thousands of black Africans across what's now South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, um, Namibia, and their motto was the IWW motto. An injury to one is an injury to all, right? Fast forward, in the 50s, the leading South African union was called SACTU, the South African Congress of Trade Union. Their motto, an injury to one is an injury to all. Fast forward to today, COSATU, the large federation of South African unions, uh, the Congress of South African Trade Unions. Their motto, an injury to one is an injury to all. Right, so we've got a direct line um, over a century now of the impact of the IWW in, well, what's the largest countries, the, the, the economy, the largest economy in Africa, right, is South Africa. Um, I'm mindful that I've just crossed the threshold of what I was supposed to speak for, so I'm going to speak, on, um, speak a bit longer. But uh, So the IWW was also very influential in um, Sweden, right? A lot of us have heard of Joe Hill, the songwriter, who was a Swedish immigrant who came to the U.S. Um, you probably haven't heard of PJ, PJ Wielander, pictured here. Um, but he was a Swedish immigrant to the United States, joined the Wobblies in the United States, 
And then, like many immigrants did, moved back to his home country right, in the 20s. Um, and when he did so, he uh, brought with him the IWW. Right? Um, and so the Swedes in the 1920s and 30s Sorry. had multiple different labor federations, and one of them was basically called the Wobblies, although they officially were not the Wobblies, but they organized in the same sorts of ways. Um, Another of the really interesting chapters in the book deals with Spain and the Spanish Civil War, a subject that lots of us are interested in. Um, the communists organized what were called the International Brigades to fight against the fascists on behalf of the government, called the Republicans. Right? Um, and the International Brigade from the United States was called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Right? Um, it was largely communist. Right? And thousands of um, American communists good-hearted people for the most part, right, um, went to fight on behalf of the Spanish Socialist Party, right? Um, what is not known is that dozens of Wobblies joined the Communist Brigades, right? Um, and uh, that would be very surprising because the Wobblies and the Communists by the 30s hated each other, right? Um, and the Soviet, the Communists had done a lot to try to destroy the IWW in many countries, right? Um, but if you wanted to fight for Spain and against the fascists, you either fought with the Communists or you didn't fight. Right, um, that's the same reason, of course, famously George Orwell went to fight with the communists, even though he himself was not a communist. Right, um, it was uh, for the same reason. So we've got a chapter, this guy, Matt White, did an amazing job of um, uh, researching dozens of individual Wobblies, most of whom from the East Coast, who went and fought. And what happened was, not surprising perhaps, was that um, you know, they didn't get along well with the communists because they wanted democracy. They didn't want to be told what to do. They wanted a democratic army, and the communists wanted a top-down hierarchical institution. Right? Um, and so most of the Wobblies ran into trouble with the communists because they had very different ways of thinking. Right? It's a nice way of putting it. Um, last thing I'll say is um, Joe Hill, coming back to Joe Hill. Um, the music of Joe Hill continues to animate many of us. Right. Joe Hill, of course, was a Wobbly in the United States, although Swedish born, his uh, English name, Joe Hill, Joe Hillstrom, right, his uh, original name. But um, Hill wrote many great songs, um, some of which are in the Little Red Songbook. Um, his music and his songs continue to be very influential in many places. Right? And so, of course, it was just two years or two and a half years ago that was um, the anniversary of his execution in the state of Utah um, by the state for a crime he did not commit but nevertheless uh, that he was killed for. Um, so the music of Joe Hill is the last chapter in the book um, because it takes us really into um, present time. Uh, in the 21st century, of course, the Soviet Union has collapsed. We are supposedly uh, um, in a global capitalist world, but we also know that there is close to seven billion of us, and a lot of us are discontent, right? Um, a lot of us feel very uneasy. Um, a lot of us are worried about our jobs. Some of us don't have jobs. A lot of us who have jobs, they're not very good jobs. Right? Um, a lot of us aren't gay, right? um, and we are constantly faced with threats from companies that are very powerful, maybe more powerful at this time than us, um, and also from automation, right? um, which is increasingly making many jobs, including the job of teacher, um, precarious, meaning uneasy. Right? Um, what if we all worked four hours a day instead of eight hours a day? Well, there would be a lot more work to go around, right? Um, uh, so the IWW has been thinking revolutionary thoughts in the 20th century, but they continue to do so in our time, right? And providing, I think, the reason why the IWW has been growing in recent years is because there's a lot of uneasiness about global capitalism today, right? Just in, not just in the U.S., but also in other countries. And that's all I have to say tonight. All right. um, thank you all for your attention. All right, our second set of speakers are ready. Come on up and uh, speak away. We'll take about 15, 20 minutes or thereabouts, and then we'll get into a good question and answer session. Um, you know, so let's just keep at it. And uh, when you come up to the mic, please state your name and your affiliation with the union. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I'm fellow worker Jasmine. I'm a student and a mother, and I'm the secretary of the local chapter of the Chicago branch. Um, along with the rich history that has greatly influenced the shape of labor today, the IWW continues to fight with for and as the working class. To quote our website, the IWW is a member-run union for all workers, a union dedicated to organizing on the job, in our industries, and in our communities. 
IWW members are organizing to win better conditions today and build a world with economic democracy tomorrow. We want our workplaces run for the benefit of workers and communities rather than a handful of bosses and executives. As you've already been familiarized with the IWW's history, I'd like to talk to you about the present, um, about our current actions and campaigns, and the activities of the IWW, both the wider union and the local Chicago branch. In North America alone, the IWW has nearly 300 current active members, and many more outside the North American region. This number also does not include those who are inactive or have been members previously, or those who are only members of the General Defense Committee, which has less strict rules about membership qualifications. <clears throat> Even though our current incarnation of the Chicago branch is less than two years old, we boast an ever-growing and highly active membership made up largely of women and people of color, covering wide socioeconomic spectrum. Our membership includes educators, students, engineers, office workers, tradespeople, artists, rail workers, locksmiths, food and rate retail workers, and so on, some of whom are people card carriers belonging to a trade union as well as the IWW. We very much epitomize our banner slogan of One Big Union. Current I want to talk to you a little bit about our current campaigns nationwide. Um, one of the big ones that's going right now is the Burgerville Workers Union in Portland, Oregon. Burgerville is a Pacific Northwest primarily Oregon, Oregon Washington fast food restaurant offering locally and responsibly sourced healthier burger joint fare. They began organizing efforts in 2014 and went public in 2016. Much local support, support of other unions, the SEIU, ILWU, Portland Association of Teachers, Oregon Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals, etc. And they staged many successful strikes and pickets, currently demanding a $5 an hour increase across the board in better working conditions. They had received much media coverage in local papers, news stations, and they offer union benefits above and beyond standard union, union benefits, such as free babysitting for union members, discounted bus pass passes, monthly food boxes, as most workers make poverty wages, and GED tutoring for all members a grievance hotline for reporting um, employee mistreatment or job safety concerns, and assistance from the union in resolution planning and execution. There's also the Stardust Family United in New York City. Ellen Stardust Diner is world famous for their singing wait staff, which is composed, comprised of both aspiring and up-and-coming stage talent and Broadway veterans, and is one of the most profitable restaurants in New York City. They went public with 50 employees having unionized and later, later in 2016, after a response to a rash of firings, harassment of employees, and policy changes that coincided with a new management team. In addition, management has ignored safety violations and concerns, denied workers' comp and, sick and vacation pay, and complaints of discrimination. Employees have been fired for joining a union and in mass union busting firings. Financial relief and legal fees were paid for by the union via dues and fundraising. The owners of Ellen Stardust Diner eventually offered all three on <coughs> fly fired employees their jobs back and pay as compensation, or and back pay as compensation. 13 employees opted to return to work. They filed lawsuits and unfair labor practice, practice charges with the NLRB. They used tactics such, tactics such as shift strikes, collective refusal to re perform uncompensated work, blockaded delivery trucks at the restaurant, marched on the management, management demanding reinstatement of tip buckets, accounting for up to a third of their pay, picket lines and demonstrations outside the building effectively dissuading potential customers from en entering. Their current goals include convincing management to provide a clear disciplinary policy, and the establishment of a committee to pro provide grievance procedures similar to that of the Burgerville Workers Union. Um, here in Chicago, we have the Dill Pickle Co-op. Um, yeah. they, they won the NLRB certification election in March of 2017, and they're still in the early stages after some setbacks from growth in the company. Current goals include worker safety training, increasing member membership numbers, an open budgeting process in the workplace, a formal grievance procedure, and a living wage for all employees. Um, here in Chicago, we also have an active uh, branch of the General Defense Committee, a quote from the DDC mission statement. <clears throat> the General Defense Committee is a committee of, of and supports the revolutionary unionism of the industrial workers of the world. The GDC's goal is to defend and support the entire working class, divided and under attack by those who wage class war against us. We therefore promote, through organization, action, and outreach, a mass non-sectarian defense of the class in order to build a self-organized working class that treats differences as strengths and opportunities to live in solidarity. The Chicago GDC Local 3 works in close contact with the Greater Chicago IWW branch, collaborating on educational efforts and the like, and, is, and supports a number of dual card members. Our GDC Local is still young, but is quickly gaining membership and have been actively supporting local area workers, mostly in the area of education, but also in the streets with anti-fascist work. 
They have a mental. They have mental health work, workshops. They have know your rights training, collaboration with the National Lawyers Guild. They have information security training, focusing on protecting your internet presence to decrease the possibility of doxing. They offer picket training, collaboration with the Greater Chicago IWW. Logistics and strategies to enable successful pickets and demonstrations. Fellow worker, on, fellow worker Carl is at our table in the back and can answer any questions you have about the GDC. Um, we also have a really interesting Junior Wobblies branch um, involving the families and children of your union. Many branches have some form of Junior Wobblies offering child care during meetings where the activities are union or labor, edu labor education related. We offer play dates and get togethers for enjoyment, recreation, organizing efforts. Meetings, meetings specific to children involving parents as well with labor related stories, crafts, and activities. Meetings specific to older children where they can participate in support for their parents' actions, learning logistics and strategies themselves, creating signs and banners, working alongside their parents for the goals of bettering their families' lives and their futures. We have an annual Junior Wobbly Summer Camp, which is a multi-day sleepaway camp, um, which provides general sleepaway camp type activities like swimming, canoeing, sports, those sorts of things. And themes such as Organize Your School, where Junior Wobblies participate in workshops and role play and organize their own student, student union in the camp. Yeah. We offer education and outreach through the Greater Chicago Branch. Conducting trainings and educational events, promote the membership outside trainings and educational events, gathering and distributing literature and holding social events. Um, we offer organizer training 101 and 102, which helps people um, learn how to organize within their job. Uh, it's a two-day class um, provided to membership and organizing tactics and strategies on the practical and theoretical level. We offer picket training in collaboration with GDC Local 3. Um, we offer parliamentary procedure training for meetings. Formal trainings are being planned on how and how-to literature is already being provided, as well as a shadow programming for practical education. We offer defensive Chinese boxing classes. Intentions of future trainings on topics such as labor law and workers' rights. Discussion of providing material to help our members in um, pantry interview closed closets, as well as possible workshops involving the sharing skill sets that could be beneficial to other members. Promotion of outside educational opportunities held by branches and other groups entirely, such as an upcoming medic training. And we hold frequent regular social events to promote camaraderie in the spirit of collaboration among our members. In summation, uh, the Chicago branch looks forward to a greater increase in membership. We've been growing steadily over the last few years, and um, more and more people are joining all the time. Um, we look forward to a greater um, involvement in the community and organization within various workplaces in the city. Um, that's all I've got for you tonight. Thank you so much for listening. All right. All right. All right. Now I'd like to have uh, both of our speakers come up. Is there anybody who's uh, helping? Jonathan, are you willing to help moderate tonight? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, you it, Charlie, you did collect, correct? Oh, no, Jonathan did. Oh, Jonathan did? Jonathan took okay. three bucks if you didn't. All right. <laughs> well, Charlie, Jonathan, do you want to take over and handle the questions? And uh, will right. our speakers, both of you, please get up to the front and introduce yourselves? Okay. 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 Okay
Uh, to, to me, the uh, the author uh, correctly uh, characterized the IWW as an anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist organization. Yes. It's oh. obvious. They okay. studied in France under anarcho-syndicalists, and they brought that program to the U.S., and they implemented that program here. Okay. Um, I used to go to those socialism conferences uh, done by the ILO. Uh, why do why? Yeah, that's a question. Why do they say that the IWW was never an anarchist organization? That it was only an, an um, a syndicalist organization. That it was never anarcho syndicalist. They they say it was syndicalist. Okay. okay. The, the words uh, syndicalism in France means unionist. It just okay. means plain unionism. A union in 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 French is a syndicat. Okay. But no, um, it was a narco syndicalist, and I hit the IWW website uh, a couple of weeks ago in preparation for coming here. What's your question? Why does okay? Why why does the IWW website say the IWW was never anarchist? Was never a narco syndicalist. Okay, it's, it's, use the microphone. Please it's use the mic. Sorry. And I, it can, I believe it's in an attempt to um, distance ourselves from the more radical elements um, that, while they exist within the union, we try to appeal to the masses as a whole and, um, as such, like to distance ourselves to a certain extent, at least publicly, from the more radical roots and get more people from the community involved, I think would be. Uh, an honest answer. When you say radical, you mean violent? Actually? Not necessarily violent, but but. I don't get it. Looking for revolution. Yeah. All right, next one, Jonathan. Yeah. Neil would like to respond. Direct, direct response. Uh, we've got public relations issues here. Uh, there's there's an archetype, there's a stereotype about anarchists dressing in black and throwing bombs. And there's semantics. Well, well, fra frankly. Uh, nowadays, anarchists, when we throw bombs, do not dress in black. We're very colorful and sometimes color coordinated. <laughs> and I'd like to add that we're also very anti political, so it's also an attempt to distance ourselves from any political party as, as and be the one big union. Next one. Green, that? Um, in your presentation, yeah. you had a couple of signs with female yeah. wobblies. Oh, what industries, on average, were the female oh, wobblies? Who did they did they work in? Yeah, yeah, you too busy. The question is about female wobblies. Um, so, you know, the yeah. there were fewer female wage workers than there were at this time, and so, in terms of wobblies organizing women. The types of industries that women were prevalent in were especially um, like textiles and garment factories. And so some of the most famous union strikes that the Wadley's led were in Warren's Massachusetts, right? Nicknamed the Red and Roses strike. Um, that involved tens of thousands of workers, predominantly immigrants and predominantly women, um, as well as in Patterson, New Jersey, also silk factory workers, right? And so in um, those sorts of industrial trades, um, while we've also organized, uh, attempted to organize uh, domestic workers who were female, right, especially in Denver, Colorado. Um, and then I, I always like to point also that the Wobblies, although I like the idea of brothers and sisters, the way that most unions in America refer to their fellow members, Wobblies always call themselves fellow workers. It was intentionally gender neutral, right? Um, and so the Wobblies were, um, Fully committed to gender equality, but the truth of the matter is, is that there were most members were male, right? Um, and most leaders were male. Although they also did have a number of female leaders. I intentionally mentioned Edith Burnett because no one's ever heard of her, right? Um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is a far more famous female leader in the Wobblies in the early 20th century. Um, and a lot of people don't know that Margaret Sanger, before she helped create Planned Parenthood, was actually a Wobbly. Um, and organized like a, what was nicknamed the Children's Crusade during the Lawrence Strike, where striking families couldn't afford to take care of their kids, and so they basically shipped their kids off to sympathetic families in other cities in the Northeast, and it created this huge public relations nightmare for the bosses. Um, because uh, everyone's sympathetic to children, right? So um, there's a number of interesting historical examples, right, of women's activism in the IWW. Yeah. 
and Lucy Parsons, of course, was a founding member. So was Mother Jones, right, um, who was president of Chicago in 1905. Right. Well, who is it? Um, I think it was him. Yeah, hello. Uh, can you stand? Can you stand and, and state your question? I, I don't like to stand. There's a camera on my face. Right? I, I okay. Um, I remember reading about Emma Goldman and how the, the, the authorities acquired uh, information about people who had uh, re registered for uh, the Mother Earth newsletter. I'm wondering if the Wobblies uh, are privy to en encrypting encryption technology, computer security and talking to those types of people, uh, you know, regarding surveillance and such things. Yeah, um, so. Okay. Uh, can you rephrase the question, please, so we can hear it again? I'm wondering if the lobbies utilize uh, uh, security technologies within their organizational methods. You don't have to answer So, he, he wants me to do it. Um, so, that it's on the microphone and everyone can hear it. Um, so he was asking if the IWW uses encryption technology and info security. Uh, information security is very important. Um, we take it pretty seriously because we are a union that has been criminalized in the past. So it's pretty important to us to keep our membership under lock and key. Um, the GDC, the local GDC Local Three in Chicago here, just had an infosec party, uh, well, party um, about two months ago, where we scrubbed ourselves from the internet for the most part. Um, the issue with info security in Chicago is that we're so heavily monitored here that essentially encryption is for the most part pointless. Um, it sounds kind of depressing, but like there's machines going around, there's police vans, they're they're cracking everything. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, next. Dave. Okay, my question is for you. A little louder. Um, first of all, I don't know whether Illinois did this or not, but in California, a number of states, there was a law against the teaching of what they called criminal syndicalism. Has that touched on at all in your book? So criminal syndicalism, the wobblies, going back to an earlier question, were often referred to as syndicalists in the United States. And essentially, in the um, 19-teens and early 1920s, dozens of states created state criminal syndicalist laws that essentially criminalized, made illegal membership in the IWW. Um, I confess I don't know if, I don't think Illinois did. It was mostly Western states, although I'm not sure about that. Um, but uh, you know, so in our book, there's really, I don't recollect anything really about that matter. Most of our chapters deal with um, countries outside of the United States. Um, and so um, every country does have different law, right? Um, and so to my knowledge, um, no other uh, nations had those particular sorts of repressive laws, although yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, I guess. Another very quick question. Did you dream about Joe Hill last night? <laughs> last night I was um, not with my girlfriend, so I dreamed about her, of course. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, I no doubt did dream about Joe Hill. Okay. All right. Uh, if you uh, are you guys all Sox fans? Because they're the team that oh, usually on. has labor. Or are you Cubs fans? This is stupid. You can ignore the question if you wish. Yeah, ignore it. <laughs> ignore it. If you don't have a good question, be quiet. Right. You sound like an yeah. AFL CIO member, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Heard this enough. Wait, wait, let me see. Not All right. Homeless. There was homeless. There was wait, 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 Charlie. There's Order. record homelessness in California. These people are living in the street. They got trash and debris all over them. I saw them yesterday in L.A. Yeah, uh, and uh, question. the question is, why do you support immigration? There's no jobs for these people. They're living in the street. What's wrong with you? Socialists. <laughs> all right. Uh, so your question is basically, why do we support immigration while there are homeless in the street? I think that that is absolutely the wrong question, and I can tell you why. The reason that there is homelessness in the street is because of capitalism, and if we don't do anything about it, it's only going to continue. Um, I was looking at this today. Um, so 
in Chicago, as well as all over the world, cities are designing uh, areas, or cities are doing design work to specifically deter homeless people from being able to sleep. Also, the, the issue is not jobs, it, the issue is work. You can't, criminalizing homeless people is absolutely the wrong thing. Huh? Work and jobs. I'm, 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 the question isn't, uh, the question is distribution of wealth, right? Like, and so there's plenty of money, it's just in the hands of the few, right? Uh, and so the problem isn't borders, the problem is that, you know, there's a handful of people who are billionaires, right? Like, uh, and so if they didn't have that wealth, there'd be no homeless, and so the solution isn't keeping people out of the country or keeping them in. The solution is actually taking the wealth from those who are rich and sharing it with the rest, right? Like, and so it's not borders, right? It's distribution of wealth. Right? Um, one, one other thing. There are six empty homes for every homeless person in this country, so... Who's paying for it? Yeah. Us. We what? gotta pay for them. Why we do we gotta to pay, pay for all these homeless people? Yeah. Yeah. These that's homeless a, people that's from a, Mexico. Huh? Why do we gotta, why do they come here, why do we gotta, your, 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 your points kind of moot under capitalism, to be honest. You can give it in a rebuttal. Pay for, pay for the poor of Mexico. Gentlemen, yeah. Yeah. Okay, next. Uh, how does, uh, without any sort of political action, how does, or how did, or how does the IWW plan to restrain or abolish capitalism? By giving power to the workers and, um, building grassroots unionism from the bottom up. And the more power that the workers take, the better their conditions will be, the more equal the wealth distribution will be. If we stop letting the corporate bosses pay themselves billions of dollars instead of paying their labor what they're actually worth, then people will, will gradually erode capitalism through that process. Okay, well, look at history the last couple hundred years. So, so there's a law passed that, that supports uh, something positive. It doesn't mean anything unless the working class movement uses militant direct action tactics to back that up. Without a general strike or sabotage or work slowdown or work stoppage, that law is meaningless. It, it takes regular, ordinary people to actually back that up. The law is just something on paper. It's abstract. It means nothing. So it's up to us to reinforce whatever positive uh, development takes place with, within the courts of the legislature. I would just add that um, historically what the IWW's answer would be is that the general strike would be the solution. So what does that mean? It means that if you organize enough workers in enough workplaces, you stop work and you've seized power immediately. Right? That the, the IWW believe that essentially what is the power of ordinary people, it's the ability to withhold labor. Right? That and that only. Right? Um, and so to the IWW historically, um, it was that. The IWW was never been a highly theoretical organization. Right? And so they've, I think, in my opinion, been excellent at identifying many of the problems of the status quo. But I can forgive them for not being able to predict and envision everything about the future, right? Like, uh, um, because no one has been able to figure that one out, right? Like, uh, but their solution theoretically has been economic power on the job, right? Um, and that, um, again, we're not going to vote for a revolution. That just does, that, that doesn't happen. So, like, um, their solution has always been this quote: "The general strike." Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm anti-capitalist, and I believe in, in a working class united front. I also believe in a diversity of tactics. So do you believe, you know, as anar anarcho-syndicalists, do you believe, I think the general strike is the most powerful weapon we have, short of armed revolution, but do you believe as the, you know, the anarcho-syndicalists and the general strike in those tactics, you know, you know, whatever tactics, how would you, in capitalism, or do you believe it could be a diversity of tactics with other anarchist traditions as far as anarcho-communism and uh, anarcho-insurrectionists uh, and so on and so forth. So. I mean, I can't answer your question for the IWW as a whole, but I can answer for myself, and diversity of tactics is everything. That's the, kind of the best I got for you. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> It's the question of Jonathan. It's the question of the other. Um, 
there's okay. Okay. Uh, you didn't say anything about the pom. <coughs> Please be quiet. You didn't say anything about the Palmer raids. I know your book That's probably doesn't right. say anything about that. But what about other countries? Were there similar things, the Palmer raids in Italy, France, Australia, uh, Canada, Mexico, Chile, wherever else? What, was there ever, were other governments as repressive as the government of the United States? Mm -hmm. So the Palmer raids were named after the attorney general at the time, whose last name was Palmer. This is in the late 19-teens and early 1920s, what sometimes is also called the first Red Scare. When we think about the Red Scare, a lot of us fast forward to post-World War II, but that was essentially Red Scare 2.0, right? Um, so the first Red Scare is also sometimes called the Palmer raids. The Wobblies were actually sort of um, arrested their leaders and imprisoned before the Palmer raids, right? Um, but the answer to your question is, Yes, in many other countries, there, the state yeah, often the used its power in order to weaken or destroy the IWW. So for instance, in Australia, um, there were, during and after War One significant repression of the um, IWW. I mentioned it briefly, because the IWW was so um, popular, even if not large in Australia, um, the actual majority labor movement actively agitated on behalf of freeing Wobbly prisoners, which is very interesting. It's very different than what happened in the U.S., where the AFL actually was actively colluding with the government in order to destroy the IWW. Um, and in other countries, too, there's no shortage of examples of state repression, right? Like, uh, so, um, not unique. Um, and post World War I was also a, a period where there were a lot of this was going on, right? Somebody over here have a question? Uh, you uh, talked about a four-hour day, four-day work week. Um, I think the problem is with artificial intelligence, you mentioned automation, there are going to be fewer jobs. People used to get their get their income through their through a job, but there are going to be no jobs for a large percentage of the population. Are you giving any thought to how how income can be given to people they're not going to have a job how can that be engineered so that's not the future that's actually the, the present system right in many countries unemployment is roughly 50 percent right in much of the developing world the informal economy which basically means people working but not without official jobs already is here right like uh, um, so the informal economy um, combined with automation you know, the, the system already does not work effectively. Personally, I think work has meaning. And so uh, I would like to uh, envision a world in which we all work a little, because work has some meaning, but um, as opposed to being just having computers do whatever. Or, um, but um, the eight hour day was established in 1938 in the United States. That means it's been 80 years, right? Like, it took 50 years to get an eight-hour day, actually, um, uh, for wage workers. And so we stopped, right? Like, uh, and so it's pretty clear, actually, one of the main arguments for reduction of the hours is you widely distribute the work, right? Um, you still need the same amount of work done, but you have few, fewer hours per person, right? And so the four-hour day wouldn't be a bad idea, but you know, a number of countries in Europe have moved towards the seven and the six-hour day, like the 35-hour week, the 32-hour week. Right, that could be if you believe in incremental change. Right, um, you gradually reduce the sort of hours, not just for wage workers, I would say, but also salaried workers. Yeah, um, that's one possibility. Turn the wobbly, Charlie. Yeah, we're having the teamsters come here and make. What do you think about these mainline business unions? Do you think they? Why don't you take? Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys work way too closely with the bosses, and I think that that's a huge mistake. Uh, well, I'm not you're a never, Well, I mean, you're wearing an <laughs> AFL-CIO hat. Uh, like, let's be real. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and and your, your willingness to work with the bosses is a negative toward the working class, and yeah, it's, you're, you're not going to make any real change. All you're going to do is make incremental things that obviously haven't worked out for the last hundred years, if not more. Better to be called a criminal. I mean, what what is a criminal other than someone that's being told by someone on high that you've done something wrong? If you do jaywalking, you're a criminal. 
if you steal food, you're a criminal. I would just add that um, that in many countries, not just the United States, right? These are the same debates that are happening, right? Like, uh, um, do you organize within sort of legally sanctioned unions? Do you, are you working to reform or revolution? And so, one of the things I like about the book that I helped edit, right, is that we see that uh, America is not exceptional, right? Like, uh, not unique. That in fact. People are asking these same sorts of questions, important questions, right, in many different countries, right? And I think that's actually the key to understand, right, um, when we're thinking about how to organize, that we're not the only people thinking about these things. Uh, this has been the case really since capitalism was evolved, right? Um, I know you talk a lot about about the resources that you are well. I know you talked a lot about the resources that you offer. And things, but how are you adjusting your um, adjusting the um, the resources to today's time? I know I'm 23 years old. I have friends that just recently graduated out of college and can't find work. What kind so of jobs do you guys offer yeah. as well? If you don't offer any formal employment, it's a volunteer organization. We just support workers that currently have jobs, or if you're unemployed, you're welcome to join the union. And um, there are often options. Um, we often have. Um, leads on jobs that where we want people to go in and work and and organize on the job where we know that the conditions aren't really good but you can get a job there and start organizing within that condition to make it better for everyone um, but we don't offer any formal employment speaking of salting which is what that's called when you send someone in to work for some place and organize it we actually have one that is a current lead, so we they're currently hiring a large amount of people, and we know someone who can. And I have them. a question about the four-hour work shift day. Um, how a person is supposed to um, afford their lifestyle if they're getting paid eleven twenty-five, only working five hours a day? Right. I mean, uh, you uh, same wage, fewer hours. Right. Like uh, that's the argument. Right. Like uh, so, of course, employers don't like it, but you don't have to like the employer. Right. Like uh, they have plenty of wealth. Right. Um, and so you reduce the amount of hours, but you earn. You don't earn any less. That's the argument. Okay. On the mic, please. I, I can put that in a practical sense. Um, like right now, you see uh, a lot of fast food places uh -huh. um, automating cashiers. Yeah. Essentially, the idea would be that, well, while fighting, obviously, on, alongside it, you, once that job is automated, no one has to do it anymore, and instead of firing those people, you move them to do other work at the company, and then that makes less work for everyone, while everyone's paid the same, if not more, because we are doing union fights for better wages, better, less hours, better yeah. conditions. So are your, is your organization connected with the $15 an hour McDonald's campaign? I don't. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we support, we any, support it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is there anybody who hasn't asked a question yet that would like it's to ask a question? somebody over here. No, he already he asked a question. Oh. Okay, if there's nobody who hasn't already asked a question, we're going to go to folks who have already asked a question. So it's your last chance if you haven't asked one yet. I got an intelligent one this time. Did you already ask one? I already asked one. Okay, then I'm going to go to this gentleman. But I'll go to, I'll go to you right after. Okay. I'm going to go to you. Okay. I remember reading about the Pullman strike. I don't know, Tim. Pullman strike actually got an intelligent question. Well, um, so within four days, there was like 125,000 people Right, across 20 some states refusing to work. How is it possible that prior to the television, prior to internet, they could organize in the hundreds of thousands? Well, it's very simple, actually. Repeat the question, people, please. Um, the question is, in 1894, when the Pullman strike happened that started in Chicago but spread to the nation, how did they organize before the internet, before phones, before telephones? Um, it's, uh, people have been organizing for years um, without these technologies, but of course they did have some technology. They had a telegraph, right? And so they could communicate by telegram, but people also travel, right? Like, I mean, they literally worked in the railroads, right? Um, and so they hopped from place to place, right? Um, the same way we get news every day through the print news. They did it then too. There were wire services that provided exchange of information, um, but also people moved around, right? Like, and so, although you're right that it was more complicated, right? It would be simpler if you could send a text blast or a Twitter. Um, but in fact, it was done quite successfully 
among many hundreds of thousands of people, like you pointed out, across many thousands of miles, as you pointed out, um, because they worked in transportation, right? Like, and so it actually wasn't beyond you know, their means. Also, the reason why general strikes are almost impossible to put on now is that they've been made illegal due to their effectiveness. Um, our government has criminalized the right to free assembly, which is pretty insane. Um, actually, it was the Teamsters that used the secondary strikes so effectively in the 40s and 50s, I believe, and earlier. Well, 1934, yeah. Teamster Rebellion in Minneapolis. Yes, and then they, they made it completely illegal to do secondary strikes because our government works for the bosses. Okay. Um, I'd like to know if any of you know about the Wall Street bombing in 1921 and uh, was the Wobblies or anybody else in that in that event because I know there was a lot of labor disputes back then and you know there was actual bomb in Wall Street that blew up the banks much like you'd see maybe some of the Taliban doing in Kabul. Can you comment? Well, the Wobblies weren't involved in the Wall Street bombings uh, in, after World War I, um, so that's all I guess I'll say about that. You can read Wikipedia. Um, and, <laughs> sorry. Um, Jonathan, we got to go into rebuttals. Uh, what do you, I mean, do you have? We still have some more questions. But okay. Yeah, but uh, we also have a rebuttal period. Has anyone not asked a question they would like to ask a question before we get into rebuttals? We really encourage everybody that there's no wrong question. One more question. Oh, I just yes. that guy had his hand up long before yeah. most of these guys. Okay. The Trump economy is doing very well. Not him. I don't mind redistributing my question to another person for the sake of time. Okay. I can talk to you guys afterward. Okay. I say, uh, the, the Trump economy is doing very well. The 3% uh, growth, the uh, stock market, the unemployment. Uh, it's, it's doing very well. The rich are for doing who? Very do, well. huh? For who? For who? For, it's for, the, country, doing well for the, the country. Rich. For the country. For the country. No. Do you believe in that fake news that MSNBC talks about? <laughs> if you think that we're affiliated with MSNBC, you really need to start paying attention. You're radicals. <laughs> okay. we're radicals. MSNBC is radicals? Are you kidding me? MSNBC is totally liberal. Raise your hand. You want to get rid of We'll go for what, four minutes, three minutes? I think so. Explain to the audience members exactly what happens. I know the rebuttal process because there's a lot of new people here. You can speak at the microphone, anybody who wants to, three to four minutes to uh, give your response to what our speakers have presented in their presentation this evening. Agree, disagree, things that spark your interest, or you got ideas from them speaking this evening on the topics that they've covered. And let's thank our speakers once again. You got, a, you, got a, you got a timer? Do you, do you have a timer? Okay, Jonathan, do you have a timer? Yeah. Okay. Four minutes? Uh, yeah, four minutes, but... All right, go ahead. Interesting talk. I, this I, hat I, means I, you got 20 seconds. Oh, so wear it or not? Wait, wait a minute. Okay. In the mid 70s, I was an administrative assistant for the Socialist Party USA. I was given the job of going through our our boxes of old stuff to see if we could uh, uh, save rent and get a smaller office. Uh, the first box I, I looked through at the top was a mint edition copy of the uh, original edition of the. Uh, Little Red Songbook. I said, yeah, there's good, some good stuff here, okay? Um, since then, I've become an anarchist. Um, uh, they used to tell me in the Socialist Party there's uh, two ends of the, the revolutionary movement. There's the economic end of it, which is the IWW, and the political part of the movement, which was the Socialist Party. Then I come to find out the IWW are disdainful of uh, uh, pl the political part of the movement. They wanted to have nothing to do with any political party including the Socialist Party, which had a lot of sympathizers. Symp people had sympathized with the IWW. And I eventually saw the, the IWW's point of view. I'm an, I'm an anarchist. I'm an anarcho-syndicalist. And um, I do not like being thrown under the bus, OK? And it, it came to my realization. Uh, the, uh, the, there's a new, there's a reincarnation uh, in the past two years of the IWW 
And on their website, they said they're not anarchists. They're, they were never anarcho-syndicalists and all that thing like that. Uh, we heard a very Marxist thing. Uh, how do workers take power? Oh, we give it to you. So the IWW takes power and they give power to the workers? Yeah, I guess so. That's, that's not a revolution, okay? Uh, that's a Marxist. Uh, that's a Marxist statement. That's a Marxist idea. And just like the uh, International Socialist Organization, which is a Marxist organization, uh, which I have many comrades and we're, we're fighting the same good fight together, but just like they hijacked Occupy Chicago, which was started out as a beautiful thing until it was hijacked by the Marxist, uh, especially uh, the Marxist Leninists and the ISO. And they turned a beautiful thing into a piece of garbage after they took it over in, in the Trotsky style. And um, I'm thinking now that they've done the same thing to the IWW uh, to say uh, the exact opposite of what this. This author said, uh, to say on their website that they were never anarchists, that they were never anarcho-syndicalists, when every thinking person knows that they were, and, and this learned author knows better than that. I, I don't know what's going on. To me, um, uh, this uh, has been hijacked, uh, apparently, by Marxists, because oh. instead of hearing anarchism, I hear Marxism <laughs> from this representative of, of the uh, IWW, and um, to, to me, we're basically on the same page. We're fighting a good fight, but um, don't throw me under the bus, okay? Thank you. Uh, a couple of people ask questions about technological unemployment. And uh, those acquainted with me may recall that I've been programming computers way too long. And uh, over the next several years, massive technological unemployment is going to move into prestigious white collar fields like law and medicine and accountancy and they're going to be dropping like flies as uh, computers take over what they've been doing. But this, this question about you know what happens when everybody's unemployed, stop and think about it for a second. What you're asking is, we are so affluent and our technology is so productive that everybody's going to starve. That's I mean, hello? That, that doesn't quite fit. You only get to eat if you make profits for the bosses is the problem. The problem is not that we have abundance for all. Um, a day or two ago, there was uh, a news item that 87% of the wealth created last year in the world went to the 1%. Technological unemployment in a civilized society is a blessing. You work once in a while, and you use your time constructively for yourself and your community, your family, friends, so on and so forth. I'm not going to dictate or prescribe your, your interests and, and preferences, but technological unemployment is a symbol, a, 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 a symptom, almost an emblem. It's not a problem. If you look at history, especially what happened in Chile in 1973, when Allende and other left-wing parties took over the government. And uh, Allende had a conversation with Fidel Castro on the nature of the state. Well, the state, of course, is an organ of coercion, the police, the army, the navy, the judges, and the courts, and the prisons are all part of the state. And whenever a revolution happens that the imperialist countries don't like, and they don't like anything that's moving to the left, they'll try to intervene. So Castro talked about this with Allende because what happened in Chile, Chile 
under Allende is they never took over, they never broke up the state and put in their own state. And what happened was, of course, they were overthrown by the American imperialists. So that's a lesson to be learned. And that's not only in somebody's mind, it's an objective truth. And that's what Marxism is actually always based on, is, a is subjective truth. Now that doesn't mean that they're right all the time. They're wrong a lot of times, but you learn from your mistakes. And if you had the IWW and one big union in the United States or any place, the first thing to happen the other imperialist states would try to take over, and the imperialists use science of their own in order to crush revolutions. And that's exactly what happened in Chile. The imperialists overthrew the socialist government of Chile. That's not only in Chile, of course. It also happened in China. In 1950, the United States invaded North Korea. And North Korea borders on China and borders on the Soviet Union. And, but they had their own state in North Korea and China came to help and they kicked out the imperialists. So th these are lessons to be learned and if you don't use science and if you don't understand the nature of capitalism itself, you're not going to succeed, no matter how much you try. You have to have order on your side, and you have to know what the heck you're doing, and you have to use the science of Marxism in order to understand these things. And I don't see that in the IWW. They mean what they, what they actually mean is in the long run we get some sort of communism and that's what they're after and there's nothing wrong with that but the thing is they're going all wrong about getting this power Robert John, retired chief of local 705 stop moving backwards I want to give a shout out to my fellow workers in the IWW and thanks for the presentation tonight. I mean, that's the idea of what a union is supposed to be about. One big union, you know, you know, uh, everybody, black and white, young and old, male and female, gay and straight, uh, citizens and, uh, you know, immigrant. That's what it's about, worker solidarity across the country you know, across the world. I mean, you know, the way they got the system set up is capital can go anywhere they want in the world to find the, the, you know, the cheapest labor, but then, you know, then they create all these laws, you know, if a worker goes wherever they want to get the highest pay, oh, that's illegal, you know, uh, then, then, you know, they're in a position where they can exploit their labor. They, they, like, for example, in this country where they created NAFTA, when they, they created NAFTA, they dumped subsidized corn product on Mexico and drove the farmers off the farms and they come to the United States so they won't, they won't be exploited. And then they pass cash workers law to legalize their exploitation. So, I mean, it's all bogus, you know. The whole idea is they have one big union. Because, like, for example, at UPS, we got the Teamsters at UPS. And they can even, you know, divide workers in one union. But, you know, we got the Teamsters, you know, representing most of the workers. But then we got the IAMW organi organized, uh, representing the mechanics. Then we got another union representing the alien pilots. So that's just another way they can divide the workers in three different unions and, you know, try to play everybody against. But I am for, you know, there's the contradiction. There's, I'm for union democracy. So I believe in the right if, you know, each worker wants to be, you know, uh, in IAM or the, the other union or what have you. But the, the idea is they have one big union, you know, you know, and organize the unemployed as well. Because, I mean, we don't, our enemies ain't in Afghanistan or Iraq. You know, our enemies is right here in this country. You know, this, countries aren't one big happy family. You know, the, the, the enemy of the people of the country is the ruling class of that country. Whatever country you're in, the ruling class of that is the enemy of the people. You know, some, you know, some of them are more benevolent than others, but they're still the enemy of the people and, and they're, they're the ruling class. So I believe in working solidarity. You know, across borders. The idea is they have one big international 
Union, and I'm going to be talking about an international company and in the beginning of May, UPS, the biggest uh, private sector contract in, uh, in, uh, in uh, union contract in United, in United States of America at UPS. You know, and uh, so yeah, you know, if anybody want to come on by to see that one, you know, and, and talk about the struggle, uh, the, the contract coming up, August 1st expiring, and talking about the, con the contract campaign last time, how UPS fired people around the country for organizing the vote no. Because, I mean, union's the way to go. I got teams are tattooed on my knuckles, but, you know, it gives you a fighting chance. But sometimes you got to fight the, the labor bureaucracy in your union, the, you know, the officials that, you know, any organization with money or power, there could be opportunists to come in there for their own thing. So a union as good as the people make it, as good as the, the members are involved in the union, as democratic as the union, as, as good as the union is going to be. So uh, come by uh, and hear the, the, the struggle at UPS. And it, it, it is a class struggle. I, uh, I really enjoyed the presentation tonight, and I, I really uh, I want to thank the speakers for uh, interesting discussion and interesting topic. Uh, a couple couple notes that I jotted down. Uh, I understand that uh, there are certain systems we have to work within, and sometimes you may have to uh, you're compelled to work in ways that aren't ideal. Uh, However, uh, I, I know I, you know I think that wanting to untangle the government union complex, which is what uh, I understand uh, IWW stands for, uh, I don't see how holding that position uh, can reconcile with wanting a legally mandated minimum wage. Um, I'm also curious as to why the IWW is not as prominent as it was. Uh, Perhaps it's because, unlike the AFL CIO, they didn't cozy up to authorities. Machine guns. Machine guns. All right. Uh, I'll be speaking on the 31st of March regarding uh, the ideas and history of the libertarian uh, movement. Uh, and as I sat down, I already dispelled the myth that libertarians are similar to Republicans. So I thought another myth I'd like to dispel tonight would be that libertarians are union busters or they're anti-union. Uh, libertarians believe all individuals should be allowed to enter into voluntary associations and enter into voluntary contracts, including joining labor unions and employees collectively bargaining with their employers. The Libertarian Party platform currently states employment and compensation agreements between private employers and employees are outside the scope of government and these contracts should not be uh, encumbered by government mandated benefits or social engineering. We support the right of private employers and employees to choose whether or not to bargain with each other through a labor union. Bargaining should be free of government intervention such as compulsory arbitration or impo uh, imposing an obligation to bargain. So I think the basically the libertarian position is separation of union and state. Thank you. All right. Uh, good to see all these folks here tonight. A lot of young folks, good to see them getting involved. And uh, thank you for coming. Bring, get a schedule of events in the back table and come to some more meetings. Every Saturday, we raise the flag. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, Wall Street hates unions. Wall Street loves less protections, less regulations, less unions. They don't like higher min minimum wages. They don't like environmental protections. So I expect unions and union people to start really protesting and bring, you know, bring back our Occupy Wall Street people. And that's pretty much the reason the big board's going cuckoo is that they realize you know, our society is uh, losing all its protections and regulations and, uh, you know, unions. So, uh, you know, it, it's Wall Street. It's, it's, those are the folks that are keeping the unions down. Thank you. Thank you.
Here we go again. Blasting capitalism, and it's been the best dang thing that's happened to the world in the last 300 years. You guys would still be peasant farmers if it wasn't for capitalism. The spirit of innovation. I gave up it last year. And the rise of the consumer economy. Markets work, but even Adam Smith. Workers work. Markets work because when you have a job from a company, you're going to work. Now, I'm looking at a lot of the people here, and you're basically campaigning against the abusive practices of certain employers. I applaud that. But you cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. If, because if you did, you would not have jobs, and you'd all be back to a peasant farming. The glorious thing that's talked about in communism, the workers' peasant rebellion, well, to be honest with you, I would not want to be a peasant. I love our world today. The interconnectedness, the internet, the ways that you can do things, even the way UPS delivers its packages. I work as a, as a, uh, as a internet sales for my company. We use UPS and we consider them extremely reliable for package delivery. They do have problems with, with certain things like, especially 40 inch TVs getting damaged to the customer's doorstep, but that's another story altogether. Most of the time, when you have a 99% success rate in delivering stuff, that's to be applauded. And a lot of that goes to the workers of the company taking pride in their jobs. I am stuck in a quandary because I like capitalism. I like the goods it produces. I like the fact that when China adopted it, it created more jobs, more wealth. Yes, there was growing inequality, but there has been a rising boat around the world of workers. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at the incredible results of poverty reduction we've had in the last even 30 years. There's been more people getting off of desperate poverty around the world. We're getting to be a more literate society. We're starting to see more of the world interconnected, and one of the best ways that's been done is through the smartphone and the internet. I just don't quite understand, you know, seeing the companies come out in and being not the other ones. There are a lot of good ones out there, but you just don't hear about it. Yes, there are schmucks in the, in the labor industry who hate unions, and the best way to stop that is just don't do business with those companies. You know, a lot of people tell me, oh, Walmart's such an exploitative company, but then the next day they're rare, they're, they love the bargains that they produce. You have power as consumers and as union members, but what I recommend sometimes, where we heard talk tonight about the informal economy. The reason that informal economy exists is because it's a lot harder in some of these countries to register a business, to be legal in a lot of these places. It's easy when you're part of the inclusiveness, but in a lot of places you can't. If you like, if you read a good book called The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto, it explains all this in great detail. Look at the original work of Adam Smith and his two, and his two books. The Moral Sentiments. Anyway, yeah. The, I guess I got my time, so thank you for letting me speak tonight. What you got against us peasants? All right, let's thank our speakers. Really, our yeah, Professor Kevin from Western Illinois, and all the lobs out there. You know, first of all, what, what are you talking about? You see a sweatshop, and you call that poverty reduction? Yes, I do, Charlie, because it's a necessary what are you step. Can I collect about? from it's everybody? It's a necessary it's step in the development. In the light. Anyhow, better than working right. in the fields, Charlie. Wait a minute. Is where that wobbly? Where is that big wobbly? <laughs> I go to the AFL website. I see things like how to organize a union, your rights at work, good solid labor law, like 
Then I go to the Wobbly page, and there's a picture of a guy in jail. And, he, and it says underneath it, why aren't you in here? Like, you got to be criminal. And then they say things like, direct action gets the goods. And that, yeah, that wooden shoe. You know what you're supposed to do with the wooden shoe? You're supposed to throw it into the machine. <coughs> That's why they thought the, the speaker didn't outline that. And then they had black cats that oh, they like the black cat logo. Because the black cats sneak around at night wrecking things. No, so this is that, yeah, Sambo the cat, they call it. Sabat is the, the word for a wooden shoe. Yeah, yeah Sabat. Throw you, the wooden if you want to break. And then, no, seriously, the other hallmark of the Wobblies are they didn't like traditional strikes. So they invented something called a sit-down strike, where you take over the means of production. Uh, but no, seriously. Worked in Flint. <laughs> I, I teach uh, labor history on occasion and labor educators. But there were three elements of the organized labor movement in the United States. The AFL, which was your traditional tradesmen, where you had apprenticeship and journeymen. <laughs> Uh, then he had the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And these represented men on machines, in mines, and on assembly lines. Those who didn't necessarily have a, a skill, uh, and didn't have that structure of membership and, and keeping people out and things like that. And the third element, much to their credit, were the Wobblies. And the, the, they continued the tradition like this college of complexes, they were soapbox speakers. And they fought for the free speech movement and fostered the, the celebrated speakers of the organized labor movement. Um, but seriously, the Wobblies always have stood out. Uh, tragically, they came along and they didn't want to go along with some of the labor laws. They were enacted by Jeff Tartley, and I don't blame them much to their credit. Uh, and I have, in fact, tried to balance both worlds. Um, I will file traditional grievances. But then again, there's a little concept called you can, you're permitted to engage in activities in support of a grievance. And that's where you come along, and that's where you can do whatever you want, and let, the, let things rock and roll, you know. But anyhow, thank you very much, for both the speakers and the other people for showing up. Please visit the table back there, uh, sign up, get on the mailing list, and uh, do something for the organized labor movement in the United States. Thank you very much. Any other speakers? Yeah, good and sweat job. Well, if it's poverty reduction. It is. <laughs> Chinese workers committing suicide. All right, we got any more speakers? You got, you got four minutes. Who can follow Charles? All right. Has anybody else got a rebuttal? Yeah. You got another one for a rebuttal. Yes, he is. Yeah, somebody remind me of my uh, common complaint about plastic shit. Language. Nine thousand tons of plastic shit enters the sea every day. I don't know if you, any of you have been uh, in the sea, scuba diving, or swimming in the sea. If you did, you would have seen the most marvelous, incredible creatures that you can you can imagine with the great imagination. Butterflies of the sea, all kinds of colors, shapes, and forms. So. We are a virus oh, wow. of the environment. We are a piece of shit. We plastic shit represents <laughs> what we are. We discard everything that we consume into the sea as if it was the only way to put it. And even if it is, it means that we don't give a, 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 a hood about what, what all that shit does. Now, all of you here, they are hearing me today, and I'm sure that tomorrow you will dump all the plastic in your garbage can and let it flow into the sea like it continues to do. So I, th I think that the humans have a limited, uh, a limited rent in this earth. We eventually will 
eliminate ourselves from here. And I hope we do it soon because we don't deserve this wonderful earth that we have. Yeah, Fuck you all! Go ahead. You ended on something I can agree with. <laughs> I don't know about the others. Uh, last week here, uh, toward the end, somebody, uh, Tim said, we should have some aha moments. We could have had an aha moment today to ask those uh, new visitors, what did they think about the moon land landing? I'm sure they would disagree with them that we did land on the moon. Last week was a total loss. They all, the smartest thing today that was said, uh, you don't throw out the baby with the dirty washboard. I think that's a smart thing. The word criminal, uh, it comes from like, a criminal does not discriminate, see? One who discriminates, he measures things out and he doesn't do any harm. And, uh, uh, the, the mention about the Irish and the British. The British never remember, the Irish never forget. And, uh, uh, okay, wait, I'm good. Today, for those uh, musicians here, today's the uh, birthday of uh, uh, Mozart, Wolfgang Mozart. That's about it. All right, go up there and Go up there and rebut. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not so pessimistic as our fellow student, Frank Aguilar. Still, I do not totally disagree with him by any means. Many years ago, when I was a student at Evanston Township High School, when I was a freshman, I participated along with the rest of the student body in the first Earth Day celebration. And we were addressed as part of the program by a I believe he was a biologist from north, north, uh, from northeastern Illinois State, Dr. Roger Charlier. We said that when the world ends, it's not going to end uh, with a bang or a whimper. It's going to end with a gasp. And that pretty well sums up my philosophy as well. With regard to the comment that was made earlier about how the United States invaded North Korea, bullshit. It was the other way around. North Korea invaded South Korea, and the United States responded to the help of South Korea, uh, to the request that South Korea made for our help. It was Stalin's idea to expand and try and take over all of Korea. And this has been written about and talked about. Plain and simple. What is colonialism? Colonialism? Well, it's like when the British move into some place like India or Ireland. Does that answer your question, Charlie? Thank you. What's All right. Jonathan and Emily Butler. We move into Vietnam. Our speakers get the last word. Our speakers. All right. Thank you to our speakers for a great presentation. Someone, you are one, just by you still showing up for a spot in line far from the front. Still someone, you are one of many, one of many someones. Just one, you show up, be the ear listening to the here that never comes when we need it. Still one, yet you show up, joining us. We are many, a lot more many someones. Just once, all of us, returning to those who we've loved for a scar to heal, a heart to feel enough. Still so much within ours the many, a lot more soon, close to many of. Just once, all for one, reminders all the places we're from, for a spark so high, stars barely touched. Still so much within the lives of many, that we ask, what will we the many, when we are one? To us, you're more than one, just by you teaching all of us, about more than a day, an era whose time has come. For this we demand, we the all, we the now, until we are one. Someone, you are one, just by you still showing up. For a spot in line far from the front. Still someone, you are one of many, one of many, we the someones. Um, you need somebody to have your back when you're
you're under attack from the three fools of history that we've had to suffer, which is capitalism, fascism, and what we currently have under Trump Pence, which is extinctionism. Uh, you, need, you need someone to protect the most vulnerable, seniors, retirees, people with disabilities, youths. Uh, me and my friends grew up in the western <laughs> suburbs in Bolingbroke where there was glyphosate in the cornfield where we grew up. It's just a coincidence that a lot of us kids had headaches in school and a lot of people uh, couldn't give birth to kids and a lot of people didn't have really good memory at a very young age who grew up next to that cornfield. Uh, that's Monsanto. If you think that capitalism by coincidence is always right next door to imperialism, you're living in a pipe dream. So this phrase, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, I'd like to change that phrase tonight. You can't throw imperialism out with extinctionism, should really be the phrase. You can't throw corporatism out with ecocide. You can't throw psychosis out with feudalism. Uh, these people are psychotically violent against the wobblies who are just saying we want democracy in the workplace. So that's self-defense, which is one of the first tenets of forming a more perfect union. So all the wobblies are, are saying, if you really mean what you say, you say what you mean, America, then let's have workers at the center of our community dialogue and our community's decision-making and priorities. Uh, Trump and Pence and Clinton and Kane shouldn't be presidential candidates. They should be in jail. Thank yeah. God for the Wobblies for reminding us that. And thanks for our speaker okay. tonight for being here. Jonathan, yeah. Yeah. speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, hi, I'm fellow worker and fellow defender Carl. Um, I am the local secretary treasurer of the GDC. I didn't really introduce myself last time. Um, so the what? General Defense Committee of the IWW. Oh, yeah. Um, so I wanted to start by saying the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. Absolutely nothing in common. Um, we are the ones who make everything that is wonderful about capitalism, or everything that you think is wonderful about yes. capitalism, has been made by a worker. Yep. Um, if you truly believe that capitalism has brought us up to this point by, say, smartphones, all those things, I guarantee you that that was probably, or I guarantee you that that was made by a Chinese kid somewhere who's mm -hmm. trying not to die. Um, the problem with capitalism is that it requires you to work as much as possible for as little as possible to survive. You have no choice in the matter. It is a social contract, a social construct that you were born into without any say in the matter. You have none. You still have none. You you look at our government right now. Uh, it's I mean as always it's been always the same. It's never moved in any different direction. Trump's doing the exact same thing every other president's done. They do what they want, what benefits them, it doesn't benefit us. It's never made a difference, it's never going to. The only choice we have is to work together. Other than that, there's nothing. Um, what's that? And, yeah, so, uh, we'll be around for a little bit. Um, I'm definitely going to be outside because I smoke cigarettes and I haven't had one in a long time. Um, so, yeah, if you want to talk to us, we will be here. We're more than willing to talk. Um, but last little thing is uh, also um, I wanted to make a point about the picture of the prisoner. He is not saying you should be in here. He's saying I'm in here for you and you are out there for me. We need to work with prisoners. The IWW is now having a, it's in the process of being formed, the first ever incarcerated workers union in the history of the world. This is a fantastic, fascinating time to be involved and we're doing amazing things. And hopefully, well, honestly, we don't have a choice but to win this time. Where can people find out more about your organization, the Chicago chapter? Um, well, we have our meetings, our 
The, for the, okay, so the IWW general membership branch for Greater Chicago is held uh, on the second Sunday of the month at 1 p.m. at our general headquarters, which is at 2036 West Montrose. The general defense committee has, um, which is Damon and Montrose probably, uh, general defense committee local three, I have some pamphlets and you can all get a hold of me later. We have our meetings on the third Sunday of the month at 3 p.m., but the locations tend to vary. Um, we don't have a, per a permanent space yet. We're working on it. We're very new. We've only been around for less than a year. Where so. can somebody find you on the web? Oh, um, we're on Facebook. We have a Twitter. Uh, you can contact us at Chicago, or, well, GDC or IWW. Uh, well, your local chapter. Uh, so the local chapter, well, we all, everybody has Facebooks and Twitter. Um, also, IWW.org is a good one. They'll get you in touch with us. Um, the Chicago GDC has Chicago GDC at Gmail. Um, IWW is Chicago IWW at Gmail, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we appreciate you coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, All right, our next speaker. for having me and paying attention. I appreciate it all. Um, have a good night. But if you want, I have a few copies of the book that I was talking about earlier for sale in the back um, for $20. I'll be there if you want to um, get one. If not, you can find Yay. copies of the Lobbies of the World at Pluto Press, which is a great uh, publisher based out of London, but you can buy it here in the United States on the internet. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Jonathan, calls us out. Jonathan, close us out. Jo close us out, Jonathan. And we'd like to thank our speakers one more. Thank you all for coming to the College of Complexes. Come again. With that, we're adjourned.